All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the whoever shouted. That was great. As we're uh, kind of getting settled in and, and such, it's just so wonderful to see all of your bright and smiling faces. And uh, just what a day in the, in the good way. Like, <sighs> hallelujah, we serve a risen God and we get to come here and we get to celebrate that. And we get to know that our God who loves us so much died for us and then rose from the grave so that we can have salvation. That's incredible. So as, as, we're, as we're worshiping today and as we're listening to the lesson, just, uh, you know, especially, especially today, uh, just keep that in your heart and open up your, your hearts to God because he's alive. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, song number 792, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. I know you all can probably read, but there we go. <clears throat> when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen one shall gather to their home beyond the sky and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and the work on earth is done and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll You all please pray with me father in heaven we are so grateful to be your children we are so grateful to be called your own and we just praise your name every single day of our lives god and as we worship you this morning as we listen to your word just allow us to take it into our hearts and allow us to fully just meditate on it and and Go out into the world and be bright, shining beacons and let the world know that, God, you are alive and you are at work every single day and your work never, ever stops. God, help us to, uh, to just love with all the love that you've given us, even when we don't deserve it. God, we just pray these things in your son's holy name. Amen. Amen. All right, the next song will be number 335. Lord, I lift your name on high. <clears throat> Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, 
Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. From heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth to show. Next song here uh, will be number 248, Wonderful, Merciful Savior. <clears throat> Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? souls of men. Counselor, comforter, keeper, spirit we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way. Oh, we've helplessly lost the do the Lord's Supper today, too. 
Uh, if there's anyone who uh, needs a, uh, a chalice here, uh, Derek is coming down the middle of the aisle. Feel free to reach out to Derek, and uh, he will get you one. Make sure you stick your hand up high, though, because uh, there's a lot of folks here. Uh, As, as as we woke up this morning here, um, you know, there's there's always a lot of focus on Easter. Of course, you know, we got the cute bunnies and finding eggs and whatnot, and and that's all that's all fine and dandy. That's all uh, fun and games, uh, and it's really easy to make hoppy Easter jokes, uh, you know, puns, all that fun stuff. Um, but as much joy and happiness as that brings uh, and, and the focus as that kind of entails, especially on the retail side of things as well, you can't escape it. Uh, it's so wonderful to know that we ourselves, uh, you know, we have the real reason to celebrate is a risen Savior and an empty tomb. Uh, one that you won't find any eggs in. One that will not have any sort of, of bunnies or anything inside of it uh, because the only thing that was inside of it has risen and has dwelt among men again and ascended into heaven. And so as we, uh, as we continue on our day here uh, in our merriment, just remember uh, the sacrifice and the victory that we have. Uh, so would you bow with, bow with me as we pray for the bread? Our Holy Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for, uh, for your son, uh, the, the perfect example, one that we could never, ever hope to compare to, God, uh, who gave him himself, though blameless, uh, on the cross for us. And as we partake of the bread, we pray that we will reflect on the worthiness of, of him and the true the true blessings that we've received from his body being nailed to the cross. We pray these things in your son's holy name. Amen. And we'll pray for the fruit of the vine. Dear God, we come before you again just to thank you for, uh, for the blood that was shed for us, uh, for the cleansing power that it brings, God. And without that, uh, without that suffering, without that spilling of blood, we don't have salvation. And God, as, as we go throughout our day, just help us, to, help us to remember that we are redeemed and we are saved because of the blood that washed away our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In additional, in addition to uh, to this here, we have our slide uh, for for the offering here. Many ways to give. Um, we've got online where you can give uh, link online or, or through the Facebook page. Uh, there are you give via text message. I know that's pretty easy to do. Um, there are just many ways to give, and I, it's something that. I think sometimes we'll get just out of sight, out of mind, um, but we do have so many great things here going on, and it's, it's all made possible by uh, the giving our congregation does, and so uh, we'll, if you'll pray with me, we'll pray for the offering as well. <clears throat> our Father in heaven, we are, we are truly a blessed uh, congregation. And 
there are so many great things that uh, that this body has has done and will continue to do uh, for your kingdom, God, and, and throughout our community um, and in the greater parts of the world. God, we pray that as we continue to uh, to give and help fund the things, the the missions and the activities and the outreach and our our goings on here that we would do so with a with a caring heart and just remember all the all the good work that goes on in this in this body god we pray all these things in your son's holy name amen so now we will go ahead and uh dismiss the kids ages three through second grade to cow time uh if you are visiting with us here and you've got a little one, that's going to be out the doors, down my right, uh, your left, uh, just past the double doors down there. You can also follow the host of small children running. And let's go ahead and uh, stand for this next song as well. I know that my Redeemer lives and cares for me. I know eternal life He is and gave on I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know. So we'll just end it there. That's, that's, we're not going to keep crashing the ship. Um, what's the next song? I don't quite recall. The scripture reading is up next then. Okay. All right. Um, the scripture reading will be up next then. <laughs> Hello, today we'll be reading Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. Again, that is Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified on the third day, and be raised again. Then they remembered his word. Well, good morning, family and friends. If you haven't noticed, we don't take ourselves too terribly seriously. I mean, choreographing things is not our skill set. And as I was sitting there and Danny was doing everything else, I thought, you know what? He's already up there. He's got a tie on. Just take the whole thing. So we're glad you're here today. And God has given us a beautiful spring day to come together. It was uh, nice to be able to share donuts and yogurt and fruit and all that other stuff downstairs and appreciate everybody who helped to make that work and especially those who helped to get rid of the stuff by eating it. That was extremely helpful. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn to the book of Acts, the 10th chapter, Acts the 10th chapter, and I'll eventually get there. I can remember as a, a kid 
during the bicentennial, the United States Mint decided to redesign the quarter, at least the backside of it. And that was a big deal because it hadn't been done in quite a while. But then along came that 50 states program, remember that? And I was one of those people who wasted a decade trying to collect a quarter with each state on it. And after that, I pretty much lost interest. A quarter is a quarter, and it doesn't buy much anymore. But a week ago or so, someone handed me a small bag of commemorative quarters, so out of curiosity, I started sifting through them, seeing what was in there. I mean, you know, somebody said one of those Wisconsin quarters with an extra leaf can go for like $4,000. Maybe, maybe, no. That's the way it always happens. But I found one from 2021, and on the back side, the tail side, was a portrait of General George Washington crossing the Delaware River. It's like, oh, I didn't know they'd made that change. But then I got to thinking, how do we know he did that? I mean, science can't help us answer that question. That's, that's not what science does. I mean, a, a meteorologist can say, well, we can look back and see what the weather was like, and, and you know, maybe it was possible. But really, all science can do is show us how it could be done back in the day, but they can't prove that George Washington himself crossed that river on the night of Christmas, in 1776, nine miles north of Trenton, New Jersey, just before the Battle of Trenton. There's just no way science can prove that. So again, how do we know that General George Washington crossed the Delaware River that night? You're going to have to rely on historical testimony, preferably eyewitnesses. And I want you to keep that in mind. Because, you know, George crossing that river that night, that was a one-off thing. So really, that's all we got is who, who witnessed it. I want you to keep that in mind as we read, beginning in verse 37 here. The apostle Simon Peter, a Jewish fisherman from Galilee, is standing before a Roman military officer and his family and friends. And he says this, You yourselves know... What happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good things and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name, Acts 10, 37-43. Now those are extraordinary claims. Are they myth? Are they legend? Are they true? I mean, this is the 21st century. People don't just pop out of graves. I mean, who believes that stuff anymore? That's the challenge, that's the question. But how can we know? How can we know if Jesus rose from the dead? Science can no more help us with that question than it can George Washington crossing the Delaware. Since Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are one-off historical events, only historical testimony can provide the answer. And Honestly, you know, some people probably said, well, I know, we just go by faith. You know, yesterday a bunch of our young people were down in Kansas City at the Sheraton participating in leadership training for Christ. And the theme this year was something Jesus said. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The Lord did not tell us to check our brains at the door when it comes to following Him. God gave us a mind. We are to love Him with our mind, and that means pursue the truth, among other things. So He's not asking us to believe a fairy tale, a myth. Now, I'm not going to go into detail this morning, ha, 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 uh, as to the reality of a person named Jesus of Nazareth. There's, there's sources that do that, so I'm just going to, to move on from there. I did prepare, I mean, this is old school, nobody reads anything anymore, but I did prepare a little thingy, brochure, whatever, you know, flyer. There's about 25 down there on the table you can pick up afterwards if you just really feel compelled to, or you can contact the office if we run out and we'll send you an electronic copy or a hard copy. But what this does is it, it goes into all the documentation about some of the things I'm going to say this morning. And I'm not going to spend my time quoting footnotes here and there and, and everywhere. Uh, but this deals with whether Jesus actually existed and looks at the evidence for the tomb in more detail than I'm going to go into this morning. Even though by the time I get done you'll think, that was not going into detail uh, kind of thing. So that being said... The New Testament does not simply claim that Jesus lived and died in first century Palestine. It says he rose up bodily from the dead. The core claim of the good news, the gospel, is that Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he was raised on the third day and his disciples saw him alive after these events. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 6. According to the Apostle Paul, the whole of the Christian faith stands or falls on the truth of these claims. If Christ has not been raised, he wrote, our preaching is useless and so is your faith, 1 Corinthians 15 and 14. So where I want to start is why would the disciples have made up this story to begin with? this Jesus rising from the dead stuff because it puts an unnecessary burden on Christianity. I mean, if you think about it, from a purely historical and sociological point of view, concocting a story about a resurrection is unnecessary to have a vibrant religious movement. Maybe you've heard of Zoroaster and Zoroastrianism. Maybe you haven't. It's been around for over 2,500 years. Started out in what is today Iran. People in the world still observe this faith system. Zoroaster died. It was buried. Yet 2,500 years later, we still find followers of the faith system he developed. So you see, you don't need a resurrection. The Buddha was cremated. And his remains were put in various urns in various monasteries all over the world. And today, approximately 350 million people follow his teachings in spite of the fact that he didn't rise from the dead. You don't need a resurrection to have a vibrant religious movement. There are roughly 1.3 billion Muslims in the world today, very devout, Muhammad died over 1,500 years ago. His grave is in Medina. During his lifetime, he performed no miracles whatsoever according to the Quran. Again, it's clear that you don't need a resurrection story to have a faith that bunches and bunches of people will follow. So... If you don't need one to have a vibrant religious movement, why come up with a story like that? It makes no sense. The Muslims don't need a resurrection story. The Buddhists don't need a resurrection story. 
So why have one? Think about that. In a sense, Christianity is unique among world religions because it's the only one that has the story of their founder rising physically from the dead. Now again, you got to wonder why the disciples would invent a resurrection story to validate their belief system when no one else in human history has felt the need to do that. And why invent it when it's so hard for people to swallow? Well, perhaps... Early Christians told the story of the resurrection in spite of the burden it put on their faith and their message because it really happened. You know, there's another unique historical fact with regard to the early Christians' claim that Jesus rose from the dead, and that's how different their response was to the death of Jesus compared to other Messiah movements within Judaism at that time. From Jonathan the Weaver in 73 BC to Simon Bar Kokhva around 135 AD, there were at least nine individuals, significant individuals, who claimed to be the Jewish Messiah. Jesus was not the first to say that, and he was not the last. Every one of them, including Jesus, were killed by the authorities. And each time that happened, the followers of those claimed messiahs dispersed. Or they found another messiah. But none of them, none of them felt the need to say that the guy they thought the Messiah was the Messiah rose from the dead. Out of all those different Messiah movements, the followers of Jesus of Nazareth were the only ones to come up with a story that their executed Messiah was still alive, rose from the dead. Why would they do that? No other Messiah movement came up with that idea. So why did these people come up with that idea? Why invent it when no one else did? And I mean, let's be honest, how many of you have ever heard of Jonathan the Weaver? That's what I thought. You know, most of these guys... It's only geeky historians who know about them anymore. So how is it this one guy, Jesus of Nazareth, has over two billion followers on the planet today when the others don't have anybody following them and their names have been forgotten? Why is that? You know, if Jesus' disciples made up the stories in the Gospels and the resurrection story in particular they were very bad at it. Here's what I mean by that. Natural human tendency is to present ourselves in the best possible light in telling our own stories, right? I mean, we will tell stories on ourselves from time to time about something embarrassing or stupid we did. I mean, we're willing to admit this mistake or that mistake and you know, maybe get a laugh out of it from someone here and there. But we will not consistently portray ourselves in a bad light, will we? I mean, consider the steady stream of tell-all stories that come out of Washington, D.C., you know, from somebody who didn't get reelected to Congress or some cabinet member who got fired or, you know, somebody like that, someone in the administration, and now that they're out of a job they figure they'll write a book about it, right? And in these stories that they tell about what went on inside the beltway, behind the scenes, they again may admit to a little mistake here and a little mistake there, but do they in their tell-all books make themselves look really bad? 
No, they don't. We just don't do that when telling stories about ourselves. We try to make the other guys look bad is what we do so that we come off looking better. When you read the Gospels, though, and two of those were authored by apostles, two by close associates of the apostles. And when you read them, we find that the disciples of Jesus Christ are portrayed consistently as petty, dense, cowardly, and they had a bad habit of waffling under pressure. You know, as I've heard other people say before, the, you read the Gospels, these are the duh disciples, not the disciples. You know, they, they just, they were a clueless crew. They look bad if you actually just read them and say, seriously, you guys, really? now why would you say that about yourself? Why would you, Peter, why would he say, you know, why don't you go ahead and put down the fact that I denied Christ three times when, you know, when the heat was on. Yeah, go ahead and put that in there. Would you? I wouldn't. I'd say, well, if we got to put that in there, just say, well, one of the guys, you know, without naming names, why would they put that in there about themselves? The only reason I can think of is they weren't interested in spin. When you're interested in telling the truth, you do it warts and all. Just swallow hard and do it. Another problem with the storyline of the empty tomb, if the disciples made it up, is that they picked some details that were the worst possible approach if you wanted people to believe you in that day and time. They talk about Jesus being crucified. And in the Roman Empire, crucifixion was reserved for the worst of criminals and, and just the lowest of the low. It was actually against the law to crucify a Roman citizen. You chopped their heads off, but you couldn't crucify them. It was considered the most shameful and humiliating way to die. There was a, a non-Christian Roman opponent of Christianity from the middle of the second century after Christ. His name was Celsus. And he wrote, Why did Jesus refuse to deliver himself from shame? At least play the man and stand up for his own or his father's honor. You see, this whole crucifixion line just it didn't wash with him. He said, Why would you say that? For the Romans and the Greeks, like Celsus, a true son of God, would have used his powers to zap anyone trying to crucify him. Jesus didn't do that, so how could he be who he claimed to be? For the Greeks and the Romans, great men either died in battle or they committed suicide to keep from being captured and tortured. But they did not let themselves be executed in the manner of the most shameless of criminals. And again, in Celsus' world, that Jesus let that happen to himself was proof that he couldn't be the Son of God. The Jews had no place in their theology for a crucified Messiah. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1, 22-23, the Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and folly to the Gentiles. Now if the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was proving such a barrier to recruitment, why continue to promote a lie you supposedly invented? I mean, if this lie isn't working, what do liars normally do if the lies they're telling aren't working? Don't they come up with better ones? Or at least different ones? Why not come up with a more believable and acceptable storyline than the one these guys were telling? 
Most Greeks and Romans did believe in life after death and the immortality of the soul, but they viewed our physical bodies as a temporary and detestable prison for our souls. So when we die, our souls escape and they are finally truly happy to be out of these physical prisons. So having shed the puny flesh, why would any soul want it back in the Greek and Roman way of thinking? Now these people could accept Jesus living on spiritually, but they could not accept his body being raised up. Why would his spirit go back to prison? It made no sense to them. Celsus called the bodily resurrection a hope that's only cherished by worms. For such a hope is simply one which might be cherished by worms. For what sort of human soul is that which would still long for a body that has been subject to corruption? The early disciples were tortured and executed for proclaiming this hope of worms. Why? Did they not know how the people around them thought about the body and the soul and life after death? Were they so completely out of touch with the culture they lived in that they made up a story that just wouldn't go down well with that culture? You know, the Gospels make it plain that Jesus' siblings did not accept his claims to be God's chosen one, the Messiah. John chapter 7, verses 1 through 5 is one example of that. And another one, Mark chapter 3, when he started going around the country doing miracles and stuff, his family went to get him. Mark chapter 3 says, because they thought he'd lost his mind. That's how they felt about their brother. He's nuts. Yet not long after Jesus' alleged resurrection, we find Jesus' relatives, his siblings, active in the church, and his brother James becoming a respected leader in the church. Acts chapter 15 is one of those examples. A first century Jewish priest by the name of Josephus, not a Christian, records that James, the brother of Jesus, was executed by the high priest Ananus in AD 61 for being a Christian. Now why would James, who failed to be impressed with his brother while he was alive, refusing to believe his brother Jesus' claims about being the Messiah, why would James turn around and be willing to die for his faith in his brother if he knew that the resurrection was a fiction, a fabrication? In fact, if James was not impressed with his brother's alleged miracles before Jesus died, what in the world would convince James that his brother was the Messiah after he was executed by the Romans? Think about it. What could possibly change the man's mind? 1 Corinthians 15, 7 says, Then Jesus appeared to James. You think your dead brother knocking on your front door would maybe get you to at least consider the options? Now, ladies, I apologize for this next one. I am just the reporter. Don't believe any of this. I don't believe any of this. I'm just a reporter, okay? But back in that day and time, the testimony of women didn't carry a great deal of credibility in first century cultures. Again, that Jewish priest Josephus wrote, let not the testimony of women be admitted on account of their levity and boldness. A first century Jewish philosopher from Egypt named Philo characterized Eve, you know, the, the first woman and the representative woman, as the reason she fell for the serpent's deception was that because she was without inquiry, prompted by an unstable and rash mind, 
Philo lived at the same time Jesus did. In the letter to Aristius, a Jewish document from the time of Jesus, the female sex is described as easily liable to change its mind because of poor reasoning powers. And again, I'm just purporting. I'm not saying any of these things are true. Leviticus chapter 5 verse 1 is a law that punishes eyewitnesses who refuse to testify. So if you refuse to testify, you're an eyewitness, you refuse to testify, you can be punished, even, even executed. But the first century rabbis said that that law did not apply to women because the women were deemed unsuitable to bear witness in court. And that's from the Mishnah, Shebuah chapter 4, verse 1. That just doesn't sound nice or pretty. But think about this. In spite of that prevailing attitude about the testimony of women, what did the Gospels do? They were written in this culture. And each of the Gospels consistently record that who were the first people to discover the empty tomb. It's okay, Tom. The women. The disciples of Jesus who were women were the first ones to discover the empty tomb because they were actually the only ones who went out to the tomb that day. Of course, the reason they were going out there was to finish the embalming process because the two guys who did it obviously didn't do a good job and you want to do it right, you do it yourself. You don't trust detail work to men. So they went out there to finish preparing the body. According to the Gospels, who were the first to encounter the risen Lord? It was the women. Mary Magdalene and then the others, they, they were the first to see him. And according to the Gospels, who were the first people to testify to others that the tomb is empty, Jesus has risen from the dead? Who were the first to witness? Who were the first to testify? The women. Celsus raise the issue of, his quote, hysterical women allegedly being the first to witness Christ rise from the dead, which for him was the deal breaker. For him that just undermined the entire credibility of the gospel message. Now think about this family. Again, if you are going to make up a story that you want people to believe, back then and there. The last thing you would want to say is that it was the ladies who discovered and reported everything first. Not only that, even before Jesus' death, as he's hanging up there on the cross, outside of John, who were the only disciples that stuck with Jesus through thick and thin? It was the ladies. All the other guys had run off. So if you want this story to be believable in that culture, the last thing you would want to say is what the ladies did. Their courage is standing at the foot of the cross while the men were nowhere to be found. They're going to the tomb that Sunday morning. They're finding the tomb empty. Them encountering the risen Lord and them going back and telling the men, He is risen. So, what's up with these guys? I mean, these disciples either completely forgot their own cultural values and beliefs or they swallowed hard and admitted the priority witness of the women in spite of the liability that would cause for their message because that's the way it happened. They told it 
because it was true. It would not have been popular with their first listeners, but they weren't interested in being popular. They were interested in telling what they had seen. They were interested in telling the truth. The gospel uniformly tells us of the cowardice of the disciples, how they deserted Christ and hid behind locked doors. They did not expect nor believe Jesus would rise from the dead. Again, that's the reason the women were out there that Sunday morning to finish the prep work. But 50 days after the tomb was found empty, these same cowards openly proclaimed in the very city where Jesus was crucified that he has bodily risen from the dead, Acts chapter 2. They held to that story even when they were faced with torture and execution, Acts chapter 4. Indeed, history records that nearly all of the apostles died violent deaths for spreading the good news about Jesus Christ. Now, people do die for lies, but not lies they themselves made up. They'll believe the lie someone else made up and die for it. But you don't, if you know you made this up, why would you let yourself be tortured and killed? Especially when this story you made up is not going to give you any financial power, any political power. Instead, spreading it around will cost you everything. That's just not how people work. We don't make up stories so that we can be killed. We don't make up stories so that we can lose leverage with others. We make up stories to gain influence. You know that New York congressman who's made up all kinds of stories about his career and his education and all that kind of stuff, and then it all came out after the election, and it's not looking good for him, is it? Well, why did he make up all this stuff? For attention. But he was hoping it would get him elected. Not disgraced in front of the entire nation. Why would these guys, these apostles, make up a story that would give them no power, make them no money, but would get them killed? That just doesn't make sense. You know, it's interesting that the early opponents of Christianity, like Celsus, never denied the tomb was empty. Never did. What they argued about is how it ended up empty. As the Gospel of Matthew records in 28 verses 11 through 15, the authorities said that these lame apostles stole the body. In the second century after Christ, a Christian we call Justin Martyr was disputing with a Jew named Trypho around AD 165 or so, and Trypho agreed with Justin that the tomb was empty, but he also said that it's because the disciples stole the body. Another 2nd century Tertullian, uh, Christian Tertullian by name records that there was a rumor that the local gardener had removed Jesus' body and put it somewhere else because he didn't want pilgrims coming and trampling on his cabbage. Celsus proposed that Jesus didn't actually die. He passed out on the cross. He re regained consciousness in the tomb. Then he crawled out and disguised himself as the gardener. A more modern story is that Jesus was a twin, and they killed his twin, thinking they killed him. I'm not making this up. An actual PhD scholar has proposed this. And so... Then they took the body and it wasn't Jesus and that's why they saw Jesus running around later because they killed his twin and thought it was him. Okay. You know, there's an intriguing find um, that was put in writing about a decade after Jesus died during the reign of the Roman Emperor Claudius, 41 to 54 AD. He issued a decree 
outlawing, breaking into, and this is a very specific decree, it was a decree outlawing, breaking into sealed tombs and stealing the body. Now, folks, normally with grave robbers, they're not interested in the body of the deceased. They're interested in the stuff that they put in there with the deceased. You know, the jewelry, the gold, all that kind of stuff. And Claudius declared that the penalty for stealing a body out of a sealed tomb was death. Up until this point, it had only been a fine. Why make it the death penalty? And what's interesting is that this particular decree, a tablet with this decree on it, was found near Nazareth. Jesus' hometown. Is that just a coinky dink? Or did it have something to do with the Jesus story? The point of all this is that the historical evidence not only points to the fact that Jesus of Nazareth was a real human being who walked this earth in the first century, lived, preached, and died in the first century. He was buried. Is that the end of the story? No. The tomb was empty. Ancient opponents explained away the empty tomb rather than denying it. The disciples, contrary to all cultural expectations, claimed that Jesus had bodily risen from the dead and the ladies were the first to see it. And when you put all of this stuff together, the claim that best fits the available evidence is that Jesus did indeed rise from the dead 2,000 years ago. So... What? So what? What does that mean to you and me here in the 21st century in America? You know, Washington crossed the Delaware on Christmas Eve, 1776. So what? Do you care? I mean, how many of us even remembered he did that? Or the date he did that? Jesus rose from the dead. The tomb was empty. So what? What does it matter? Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is true, it affirms and assures us that God keeps his promises. He'd made this promise about his Messiah centuries before it happened. You want to know whether or not God keeps His promises? The empty tomb says, yes, He does. And to me, that's a big deal, to know that God keeps His promises. Maybe not on my time schedule. I'm a Burger King kind of guy. I don't eat this stuff, but I want it my way right away now. And God says, uh, no, this isn't a cardboard crown I'm wearing I'm the real deal, and we'll, we'll do it my way. I'll take care of you. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead affirms and assures us that the righteous will survive judgment day. That's what Acts 17, 30 through 32 says. How many of us are concerned about judgment day? Afraid. Afraid for the end of the world. Why? Why? God's got you. And the empty tomb backs that claim up. The resurrection of Jesus Christ affirms and assures us that those who accept the truth of His resurrection and that He is the Son of God, we will be made righteous, justified. How good are you at cleaning up your act? How many times in your life have you turned over a new leaf only to have it flip back over? I mean, how good are you at reinventing yourself, really? How good are you, you know, when you say something stupid and hurtful to somebody, ah, I, shouldn't have, I won't ever do that again, and yet you still, from time to time, in the heat of the moment, say something stupid and hurtful to someone, someone you care about. You cannot be righteous on your own. 
You cannot be justified on your own because we suck at that kind of stuff. That's a Bible word, I'm sure, somewhere. We just don't usually translate it into English from the Hebrew or the Greek. Christ's resurrection not only proves he's the Son of God, but as the Son of God, he makes us right in God's eyes. The definition of justified is I'm, I'm going to be treated just as if I've never sinned. And it's Jesus who does that for me so that I can stand before God just as if I've never sinned, never done anything wrong. But it's the empty tomb that proves that Jesus has the power and the authority to do that. Those who accept the truth of the empty tomb and live a changed life, they're going to have eternal life. Eternal life in a wondrous place, not a horrible place. And because of the empty tomb, you and I can with confidence place our hope in God. The empty tomb assures us, but what's, what's different about Jesus than all the other religious leaders down through history? What's different about him? He's the only one who ever rose from the dead. Which means he's the only way to salvation. He himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. These are just some of the things the truth of the empty tomb does for us and means for us. To me, it's a big, so what? Appreciate your patience in listening to all this stuff. Again, if, I mean, it's nobody reads anymore. I know that. Um, so just, just pretend it's a tablet and, and scroll through it if you want the gory details, if, if you don't, not. But I hope you leave today giving serious thought to the reality of the empty tomb the risen Lord Jesus and what that means for your soul. And I hope you place your trust in God. Will you join me as we stand and as we sing?